How many of you have a crazy Uncle Carl in your family? Yeah? Um, man, we have so much to be thankful for, don't we? And this is definitely the time of year that is on people's minds and hearts of what we're thankful for. Um, how many of you had a good Thanksgiving? Yeah? It's good. Did anybody host? In your, yeah, is your house back to order yet? Or is it still so kind of all over the place? Uh, my family and I, we went up to Spencer, Iowa, where my wife's family is from. Her parents live there. And so um, we stayed there. There was in total uh, 26 people uh, in the same house for two and a half days. Uh, and so it's, it was nice to be home in our own bed last night, wasn't it? And our kids didn't have to sleep on the floor. But it was fun just to be there and be with family. Um, you know, the craziness of kids running around, and, and there's like 13 or 14 grandkids. I'm not sure. Uh, there's quite a few. And so uh, it's definitely loud. We're, I was thankful for uh, warm weather so our kids could go outside and be outside and just take the noise out there for a little bit. But all in all, it's, it's a, a great time. This is one of my f- favorite times of the year. I don't know about you, but just the season. I don't like necessarily the temperature but I like the season, if that makes sense. Um, just being together with family, being thankful for so much, and just the anticipation of Christmas and so much. So uh, definitely very, very thankful. Um, tonight I've, I've titled my message, A Grateful Heart. And um, what I present to you tonight is not, it's not a new story, a new concept or anything like that, but just pulled out a couple thoughts from uh, one of the stories from the book of Luke. So if you have your Bibles, and hopefully you do, you can turn to Luke chapter 17, and we'll get there in just a moment. Uh, there's a story of an old man who suffered from Parkinson disease. The disease dis- this disease makes writing difficult for him since he couldn't keep his hands still. So one day he asked a young man at the post office counter to write a postcard for him. The man said sure and wrote what the old man dictated to him. And he even signed this man's name to the postcard. And when finished, he asked this old man, is there anything else that I can do for you? The old man looked at the card. He thought for a moment. And then he answered yes. At the end, could you just put P.S. Please excuse the bad handwriting. (laughs) We have so much to be thankful for, and unfortunately, ingratitude, being ungrateful, has become a way of life for many people. Uh, If you were out Black Friday shopping at all, you probably witnessed a few people that were just rushing to get everything that they had, that they needed, after just eating dinner and saying thanks to God for all the things that they had already, per, you know, already had in their possession. But um, ingratitude um, is, a, is becoming a way of life for, for some. Uh, we, we find it very hard at times to say thank you. And uh, when we do, even if we do say thank you, sometimes it's in passing, like, oh, hey, thanks for supper. Thank you for this. And sometimes, like, the, the heart behind it isn't there, if that makes sense. And so um, being grateful has almost become this forgotten virtue. We, we can be quick to receive, but sometimes slow to give thanks. And uh, tonight we're going to look at the heart of the one grateful leper in Luke chapter 17. Uh, we have so much to be thankful for. Like I said, uh, a few things I'm thankful for. Heated seats. Uh, a close parking spot, uh, food to eat, clothes to wear, a bed to sleep in, um, a beautiful family, my health. Uh, and in just a few minutes, I, we're going we're gonna to end kind of with a little bit of an assignment. And uh, you're, you're free to do whatever you want with it. But I want us to take time privately to reflect on all that God has done for us, uh, to give grateful worship to God is what we're going to do. And I'll explain more in just a few minutes. But Luke chapter 17, we'll begin in, in verse 11, says this, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. So let's pause for a moment. So Jesus is traveling between uh, Samaria and Galilee. He's met by this group of 
lepers, of 10 men who had leprosy. Uh, back then, Samaritans and Jews didn't have a lot to do with each other, um, but misery can love company at the same time. These 10 men, we know that there was at least one Samaritan in there. These 10 men all had one thing in common, leprosy. And so this, their misfortune had broken down their barriers of race and nationality. Um, these 10 men, they had forgotten you know, even or just chose not to remember that they were Jews and Samaritans, and they only knew that they were men in need. Um, if a flood covers an area and the wild animals need to go to a small place of higher elevation, you will see standing peacefully together animals who are natural enemies and who at any other time would do their best to kill each other, right? But because of their need of dry land and to survive, they choose to exist together. And one of the things I think that should draw all men together is our common need for God, right? We all need Jesus, uh, it, his salvation in our lives. So these 10 men, they yell from a distance to Jesus, um, Master, have pity on us. Uh, there, I don't know if necessarily there was a required distance that they had to remain away from people who were clean, uh, but some people maybe think it, was, it could have been about 50 yards or so uh, that they're yelling from a distance, Jesus, have, have pity on us. Please heal us. Um, so think about this. Uh, these men had been isolated uh, they, from most of the people. F for some, it probably had been years since they had hugged anybody um, or even been touched um, they would this leprosy obviously was this skin disease that would um, eat at their flesh these sores these nasty sores would grow and be on their body and it would affect their nerves even to the point where they wouldn't even know if they were injured because their nerves began to be eaten away by this disease uh, so you know maybe a finger has fallen off because it's been you know taken away by this disease and so Life was not good. Life wasn't fun for them. They had it very difficult. Even when uh, people would become passing by, they would have to yell out unclean, unclean to like warn. You know, that'd be great if we, at this time of year, if someone was sick, right? <laughs> unclean, don't come near me. I have the flu. Okay, uh, thank you for the warning. I appreciate that. Um, so they would have to yell out. And they yelled out master, which in Luke chapter 5, Peter used the same uh, word, which means, uh, describes the chief commander. So these men, they knew that Jesus was totally in command of disease and sickness. And think about this, they trusted him. They had heard about him, and now they're calling out to him, and they trusted him to help them. So let's continue in verse 14. It says this, when he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So Jesus commands these ten men to go to the priests of of that time. Now the priest was not the one who had the power to heal, but the priest was the one designated to proclaim them be clean. And so that was, that was a, an Old Testament part of the law, a, a thing that they would do. They would go to the priest and the priest would pronounce them clean. So think about this. This act of faith um, at, in going uh, was, was huge. For them because they hadn't been healed yet so can you imagine jesus they yell out jesus have pity on us basically we want to be healed and and jesus says go and show yourself to the priest can you imagine looking at yourself and thinking wait a minute i'm not healed yet you know but the bible says that they went and their faith is, is an amazing thing that that stands out because they hadn't been healed yet so can you imagine as they went the Bible says they were healed. So can you imagine uh, you've been missing a finger or two and maybe, maybe a part of your ear has fallen off or part of your nose has been you know, taken away by this disease and you don't look like you, no you normally are. And as you're walking, you and your friends, your body begins to come back together. That would be a really amazing sight, wouldn't it? All of a sudden, you're, 
eight and a half fingers, you're back to 10. <laughs> you know, you can count to 10 again. Um, all these things are happening as they're going. So can you imagine the excitement? Imagine the pace that they're walking now. They begin to pick up their speed because they realize this is really happening. Jesus, what we've heard about Jesus is true, and now we are part of the healing that he has. Uh, if you had this infectious skin disease um, and you had been declared unclean, you had been required to live away from clean people, uh, the first thing I think that you and I would have done is what? Go see our family, right? We would want to go see our family. Like, okay, Jesus says go to the priest. Let's get this done quick because I got to go see my family. And nobody would have faulted the other nine. We don't fault the other nine. Uh, they all had the faith to be healed. That's the thing. These, these ten men had the faith to be healed. Uh, but the Bible records that one returned to say thank you. And the Bible does record that he was a Samaritan. The Bible says that he uh, threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. So Jesus says, where are the other nine? Um, and in a, in a sense, I've healed ten people. Why did only one return? And so... Uh, in this story here, there's a couple thoughts that stand out to me um, that I want to share with you. I do want you to notice that Jesus says to, for this one man to rise up, that your faith has made you well. An amazing thing. This man received more than just physical healing. Like his nine other buddies, they received physical healing. They were declared clean by the priest. But this guy was declared healed and whole and saved by the, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the son of God, an amazing thing. So a couple of thoughts from this story that stand out to me uh, of seeing the heart of this grateful leper. The first one is this, a grateful heart recognizes the giver. A grateful heart recognizes the giver. In verse 15, the Bible says, when he saw that he was healed, he came back. On Christmas morning, it's such a fun morning. I love waking up uh, and, and coming out to my living room, and my kids have been way up way longer than I have, right? How many of you parents had that happen? Your, your kids were, you know, not sleeping at night, and so um, I love coming out, and they're just giddy with excitement of, of opening up the presents, or you see that at your, parent, your grandparents' house or whatever it may be, um, and, and there's excitement in the air. Um, and as a parent, it is a huge blessing to hear my kids say a genuine thank you. How many of you ever parents would say that? Like, it's a blessing for your, your child to come up and recognize, like, you gave me this. Thank you. Like, not just uh, running down the hallway, thanks, mom and dad, this is awesome. But they come up and hug you, and you know it's from your, your heart. That, that to, to us as a parent, it is amazing, isn't it? Um, when your child recognizes that you are the source of their blessing and their gift. Uh, so a grateful heart recognizes the giver. Pastor Chuck Swindoll, he tells a story of a visit to a veteran's hospital. He says, the day I arrived to visit, I saw this touching scene. This man had a young son, and during his confinement in the hospital, this man had made a little wooden truck for his boy. Since the boy was not allowed to go into the ward and visit his father, an orderly had brought the gift down to the child who was waiting in front of the hospital with his mother. The father was looking out of this fifth floor window watching his son unwrap the gift. The little boy unwraps or opens up the package and his eyes get huge and wide. And when they saw that, when he saw what this gift was of the wonderful little, little truck, he hugged it to his chest. And meanwhile, this father is walking back and forth. He's waving his arms. He's and be beginning to, to you know, try to get to his son's attention, this little boy puts the truck down and he reaches up and he hugs the orderly and thanks him for the truck. And all the while, this frustrated father is going through these dramatic gestures of trying to say, listen, it's me, son. I made the truck for you. I gave that to you. Look up here. And, and Chuck Swindoll says, I could almost read his lips. Finally, the mother and the orderly turn the boy's attention up to the fifth floor window and it was then the boy cried, Dad, oh, thank you. I miss you, Daddy. Come home. Thank you so much for my truck. And the father stood in the window with tears pouring down his cheeks. How much like that child are we? How often do we pour out our gratitude to our heavenly father, our waiting father who has blessed us so much? And if I could answer for myself, I would say probably not as much as I should. Uh, God gave his only son and often we, we don't take the time to really say thank you. 
Like we'll say thank you on uh, once a month when we take communion, and the and you know and it says this do in remembrance of me, and those are that's a great moment. And and don't get me wrong, but but I hope you get my point that we have so much to be thankful for to God our Father that that just when we're here in this moment or we take communion, uh, there's there's way more opportunity to to give a sincere thank you. Is what I'm saying. This man, he's healed of leprosy, this nasty, visible disease. He realizes that Jesus is the source of his blessing, and the Bible says he returns to the source. He returned to the person who gave him the healing. He throws himself down at the feet of Jesus. This, that was a sign of surrender, a sign of honor, a sign of worship, and he said, it says he thanks him. We, we've been forgiven of so much, haven't we? Our sin... Uh, weighed heavily upon Jesus Christ. Our sin was so much. Our sin needed to be paid for. We deserved to be the ones paying for it, yet Jesus willingly steps in our place and he died this cruel death instead. So our question to ourselves is this, are we daily remembering the sacrifice of Jesus? There's an attorney who, after meditating on scriptures, decided to cancel the debts of all his clients that had owed him money for more than six months, canceling the debt. So he drafts this letter, explains his decision and its biblical basis, and sent 17 debt-canceling letters via certified mail. One by one, the letters began to return, unsigned and undelivered. 16 of the 17 letters came back to the attorney because the clients refused to sign for and open the envelopes, fearing fearing that this attorney was suing them for their debts. How profound. We owe a debt for our sin, and God is willing to cancel it, but too many people won't even open the letter that explains all of it. I want you to know that, that it's Jesus. Jesus is our healer, isn't he? Jesus is our redeemer. He's our savior, he's our king, he's our provider. Think of all the other things that could describe Jesus. And that's what we have to be grateful for. The second thing is this, a grateful heart pauses to give true thanks. Verse 15 again, it says he came back praising God in this loud voice. This this man decided to take time Um, before he ran to his family to pause and and really give a true thanks to the person who healed him of this nasty disease. Uh, Interestingly enough, think about this, the same voice that yells unclean, uh, stay away from me, is now this voice that loudly is proclaiming, Jesus, Master, you're the one who's healed me. I worship you, I thank you. Obviously, he had so much to share with his family Um, And he had a lot of other things to do, a lot of busy work to do, and it wasn't bad. But he paused, and he came back and said, thank you. Uh, We live busy lives, don't we? How many of you would say, my life can be a little hectic at times? We can be very busy. Uh, It's very easy to to work 70 plus hours a week sometimes. Wake up uh, early in the morning, go to bed late at night, uh, grinding up the, the work day, spending time with your family, all this kind of stuff. It's very easy then to come to church and think, man, I haven't even paused throughout my week to say thank you to God, to, to give a true grateful worship to him. And I want to encourage you guys, uh, a busy life doesn't necessarily mean it's a sinful thing, but when it comes between you and your relationship with God, then I, I would encourage you to evaluate things. I want to share with you a Bible verse that... Uh, um, I was encouraged by this past week in Psalm 62, verses 1 and 2. This is the Psalm of David. It says, my soul finds rest in God. And notice this word. Um, Well, okay, my my NIV says, my soul finds rest in God alone. Nothing else. I find my rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. These are things to be grateful for. Verse 2, he alone is my rock and my salvation. He's my fortress, and I will never be shaken. What stands out to me in those, both those verses, I know it wasn't on your screen, but in, in my Bible it says, uh, God alone, he alone. 
the, so David recognizes it is God and God alone that's the source of my life, that God is the source of my salvation. He's my fortress. He's my rock. He is the one that I find rest in, and it's him and him alone. God loves it. Listen, God loves it when his children offer their thanks to him. When we offer our thanks to God, he loves it. He loves to hear it. He wants to hear it. He deserves to hear it. Um, a, a prayer that I, when I was a young boy, I would hear my dad often, you know, in a time of worship and prayer, he would just over and over again say, thank you, Jesus. And, and for the longest time, I'm like, man, there's more to say than that. You know, my mind would think, come on, dad, you know, there's more. But at the same time, I wasn't offering up too much either. Uh, but now I look back on it, and I think um, knowing my dad, it was just the simplicity of a heartful, uh, heart saying thank you. You know, thank you, Jesus. Like, there wasn't much else I needed to, he needed to say, but thank you. And I would encourage you that, that um, sometimes it's difficult. Like I said, sometimes it's difficult to be in a, a moment of prayer, and you see everybody else, it, it, what seems like in a, a moment of worship and just a, a communion with God, and for, for us to think, man, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. And I would just encourage you to start with thank you. Just thank you, God. And uh, when you begin to see through Scripture all that God has done, um, it's pretty hard not to say thank you. It's pretty hard to not just give a heartfelt gratitude of, of worship to our God. And that's what we're going to do in just a few moments. We serve a God who has done mighty and miraculous things in our lives. God not only deserves our thanks, but God wants our thanks. And so through the story of this grateful leper, uh, this grateful heart stands out to me, is that he uh, recognizes the source, recognizes the giver, but also pauses to give a true thanks to him. So I, I saw an encouraging video today of Thanksgiving, so I want you to watch this and be encouraged. And worship, you, you can come forward. Today I lift my eyes to the heavens, and count my blessings. I think of all my needs that were met today. The clothes on my back. A place to lie down tonight. Nothing miraculous or earth shattering. Just a small thing to help keep me going day after day. Thank you, God. I have food on my table. Health to get me through the day. Good memories I've shared. All the beauty that makes life special. Thank you, God. I'm blessed by what I can see and touch. What I can feel in the moment. But Lord, you transcend feelings and moments. You sacrificed your life so that I could see beyond what's under my feet and over my head. <sighs> Thank you, God. That kind of love keeps my heart free. During seasons where peace is hard to come by, even when I can't see or touch a blessing, I know I can close my eyes and say, thank you, God. I've, I've lost a lot this year. Things I worked hard for. Dreams I was sure were gonna come true. People I never wanted to say goodbye to. I walked a hard path of trial. And pain and despair. But I never walked it alone. Even now, I can say thank you, God. Because no matter what is set before me, dark valleys or green pastures, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And when this life is over, I'll dwell with you in your house forever. So I just want to stop and tell you. Thank you, God. 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 So tonight, <clears throat> Like I said, we're going to have a little bit of an interactive kind of um, assignment type altar call. And you can do whatever you want with this. Uh, when I'm done, I'm going to pray and, and there's going to be no official dismissal. But here's what I would like. I intentionally ended just a few minutes early for this reason. Uh, the worship team is going to lead us. I encourage you to, to uh, make a place of prayer. Um, open up your Bible. Here's what I really encourage you to do. Open up your Bible. We can list off, right, real quick, things we're thankful for, right? The food, 
transportation, a house to sleep in. Those are really good things. But I want us to, to turn to the, uh, the Bible and be reminded of so much of God, of the benefits of serving God, of the amazing quali uh, qualities of His character. That's what I want us to be reminded of tonight because it's easy to come in and leave without really pausing. And uh, I'm, I'm guilty of that too. So in just a minute, when I'm done praying, I really encourage you to find a place of prayer and just say thank you to God. Um, I really encourage you, open up your Bible, take out a pen and a piece of paper. And, and as you read through, maybe it's Psalm 9 or 62 or 100 or 103 or different Psalms, whatever it may be, write down a specific thing that you're grateful to, God's faithfulness his mercy, his goodness. And, and here's the next step. And I understand some of you may not want to do this, and that's okay, but I really encourage you to maybe find one or two people. And after you've done that, you've had your moment of worship, grateful worship to God, maybe just pull someone next to you and say, hey, from Psalm 103, this is really what I'm grateful for. It doesn't have to be much, but I think as we speak it, we begin to like solidify it in our heart if that makes sense and you don't have to do that but I encourage you even as families parents take the lead on this for your children uh, lead them by example and show them what it is that you're grateful for so here's what I want to do I'm gonna read Psalm 103 and it'll be up on the screen and then uh, I'm gonna pray and then uh, you're free to kind of make this moment of a grateful worship here's Psalm 103 it says praise the Lord O my soul all my inmost being praise his holy name Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins. And he heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. He satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and he's gracious and he's slow to anger and he's abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we were, are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children and with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father God, tonight we give a heartfelt thank you. The tangible things that you've blessed us with, we are grateful for. But God, even on a deeper level, we're so grateful for all the wonderful things that we have just read. God, I pray that this does not become old, that we do not become familiar with the story of salvation, that we do not become used to all the things, but God, we would really truly say thank you. And so tonight we pause in the busyness of this season and we say thank you. We worship you. We love you. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Make this moment a, a moment of grateful worship to God.